So hi, everyone. Welcome to my talk, Evasive Maneuvers. Um, my name is Amit. Uh, I work at Armo. We are the makers of Cubescape, which is an open source CNCF uh, sandbox tool. Uh, I'm a Cubescape maintainer myself. And in my spare time, I like to play volleyball. So the agenda for this talk, we're going to first see how does a runtime detection tool work. Then we're going to see some ways to bypass them. And finally, we're going to talk a bit about the gaps in runtime detection tools. And uh, the way I see uh, uh, this gap in the specific ways of implementation. So how does runtime detection tools even work? Well, most of them work in a similar way of um, basically collecting a lot of uh, basic data from the system, whether it's processes, system calls, files, or network activity. And then the question is, uh, what they, they do with this information? So each tool has its own way of uh, acting. And when talking in cloud native environments, uh, the more common way are uh, anomaly detection and custom rules. So anomaly detection can be, for example, collecting all those metrics, uh, creating uh, a baseline behavior of an application. Let's say you have an Nginx workload in your Kubernetes environment. You can trace all that information, create like a baseline behavior of that uh, application, and then enforce uh, anomaly detection rules above that. And the second way is custom rules. So uh, uh, for example, detecting uh, Ravel shells or uh, fileless execution in memory, which is more like a, a signature way of detection, uh, and, and it doesn't rely on anomalies. And the third, the, the third bullet is that uh, more traditional tools like antiviruses and EDRs, for example, they use uh, uh, other methods than what we see in cloud today. Uh, and, and it is more like a hash or signature scanning and using YAR rules. And we're going to see why it's missing in today's world. So there are a lot of different ways to achieve the same goal. Uh, of tracing the information we want. Uh, you have, uh, for example, ODD or AppArmor and SA Linux. You can use kernel modules. And of course, you can use eBPF. And we all know that today, uh, eBPF is winning the race. And it's mainly because of those uh, uh, four bullets. Um, and so it's, it is relatively low footprint, right? Memory and CPU wise. Uh, so it's very convenient to use in cloud environments where you don't have a lot of resources. And more importantly, it's safe, right? So eBPF has, uh, before loading eBPF into the kernel, you need to pass the verifier, which is a very long piece of code, complicated code that validates uh, uh, a lot of things uh, in your eBPF code and prevents you from loading code that uh, can crash or that is not safe. And the third bullet is, it's fairly easy to write, uh, but it's marked with a line because if any of you wrote eBPF, you know that uh, sometimes because of the verifier, it can be uh, very hard. You have a lot of limitations like stack size or the number of instructions. But uh, like the steep climb you need in order to start writing eBPF is lower than, uh, for example, writing kernel modules. And uh, usually the, the amount of code you will write in your eBPF program is going to be relatively short, like a function, a hook, and then a simple logic. And the last bullet is observability, right? So eBPF allows you to hook in many subsystems of Linux, whether it's a file system or scheduling and processes, and it basically allows you to see everything you want. So this is why I think eBPF today uh, is the most common use technology. And so let's just see uh, how we can bypass those runtime detection tools. So the first trick, a uh, very simple one, is that uh, many of the tools are open source, right? So we have uh, uh, Cubescape and Falco and Tetragon. And the thing about open source, we all like it in, CS in CNCF. But uh, for attackers, it's uh, very convenient to just look in the code, 
look on the custom rules, and then see what the tools are being monitored on. And the, th the nice thing is that uh, if you as a company install one of those tools in the open source version, and you don't do any customization uh, by yourself, uh, a lot of the predefined rules are not uh, strict enough, so you can just easily bypass them as an attacker. So for example, uh, many of those tools uh, monitor when you access a sensitive file. Let's say you, uh, as an attacker, you want to access uh, a CPASS WD or an SSH key on the machine. So those tools will, will detect that. And you can see in the configuration files of those tools uh, which files exactly are being monitored and avoid accessing those files. And the second trick is symlinks. And uh, the thing is that with all eBPF limitations, uh, it's not that easy to resolve symlinks in eBPF. So if you as an attacker, for example, want to uh, access Etsy Pass WD, and you know that the, uh, the tool is monitoring accessing to Etsy Pass WD, what you can do is create a symlink uh, like here in the picture on, uh, on Etsy Pass WD to any path of your choice, and then read it from the, uh, the symlink. And not all of the tools resolve symlinks. But runtime detection tools uh, usually hooks on system calls, and they also monitor when you create a symlink over a sensitive file. So I would call that event. And this leads me to the next trick, which is IOU ring. And this mechanism is uh, fairly new in Linux, and it basically allows you to do IO operations asynchronically. And the way it works is by uh, using two shared memory queues. One is the submission queue, where your application can submit a job, for example, uh, create a symlink. And then the kernel read from that shared memory queue, performs the action, and then put the uh, response and the output uh, in the completion queue. Then your application reads from the completion queue, and then you can use the data. So here is an example of a piece of code in, uh, with IOU ring, which basically creates the symlink that we uh, saw in the previous slide uh, over Etsy Pass WD. And the nice thing about IOU ring is because it's asynchronically, it's not going to go through the regular flow of system calls. And that way, uh, when runtime detection tools that rely on eBPF and hooking system calls, they're not going to catch uh, uh, the, the, the symlink uh, sy uh, system call. So let's see a demo of that. Here, I have Tetragon running on the top pane. And on the bottom, we are going to first uh, create a symlink in the regular way, uh, as you create a symlink on Etsy Pass WD. And we're going to see how Tetragon detects that system call. Okay, so we can see Tetragon uh, detected syscall, uh, symlink at, uh, and you can see, like, they trigger this alert uh, when you access a sensitive file. So now let's use the custom program I wrote uh, using IOU ring, which basically uh, creates the symlink and reads the Etsy Plus WD. Oops. What's up? Gone. <laughs> okay. So let's go back. Okay, so uh, using IOU ring, we successfully uh, read the Etsy Pass WD again without uh, triggering that same alert over uh, the system call. You can see that it detected the process, the exit, but not the system call itself. So, and IO viewing is interesting because it allows you to do a lot of things, not only create symlinks, but also to execute new processes, read and write uh, 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 to files or sockets. So you can basically create an entire tool that communicates over, let's say, to a CNC server without uh, triggering any system calls at all. Uh, so it's really interesting. And the next trick is relatively 
easy and simple. Just use alternative system calls. So the way the runtime detection tools work is uh, usually uh, hooking, hooking system calls. But the thing is that they usually hook the common system calls. Uh, for example, this is uh, from a, a BPF uh, open snoop, uh, which is uh, uh, they hook open and open at, which is the common system calls for opening files but they don't hook uh, open by handle at. And many of the famous tools also don't hook that system call. So you can open files using that system call and not the other system call and stay off the radar. The next trick, this is like not really usable uh, too much, but it's also showcasing a bit the, of the, the problem of hooking just system calls, is that you can implement your own uh, uh, system call without doing the system call. So for example, if you want to implement execv, and there are a lot of POCs in uh, GitHub for that. So you can just allocate the memory yourself, load the dynamic linker, or compile statically if you don't want to. Then you need to map the executable sections into memory, set up the stack, and uh, start your uh, thread on the entry point of the process. And basically this is uh, the way to bypass execve a system call if you don't want to execute it. And the next trick, this is for me like the biggest uh, caveat with eBPF. And so in, in eBPF, maps are, are being used uh, for mainly, like for a lot of things. The first one being that eBPF stack size is limited to 512 bytes and it's really small. So. A lot of the time when you write eBPF code, you store your uh, data inside the maps. And maps are just global kernel objects. So everyone with sufficient permissions can access those maps. And those maps in runtime detection tools uh, usually are being used for communication between the user mode controller and the eBPF program. So for example, if you think about it, uh, how would you implement a runtime detection tool, let's say in Kubernetes? So you probably hold a map, which maps like which containers are you monitoring and which processes. And uh, an attacker with sufficient permissions can tamper, tamper with those maps and basically uh, uh, cause the tool to not function, but in a relatively uh, quiet way because uh, as we're going to see, uh, you're not killing the agent, you're not doing anything uh, disruptive, but you're just changing the data that the tool rely on. So if you want to see uh, the maps, you can use, for example, BPF tool, or you can write your own code to iterate the maps. Again, they are global kernel objects, and it's really, really easy to access them. So let's see a demo of uh, tampering with the maps. See if I can improve the quality. Okay. So again, I have Tetragon in the above pane, and in the bottom, I have my terminal. And here I just did a cat on Etsy Shadow, and we can see Tetragon detected the read system call on a sensitive file. But now, um, I, have a, I wrote a custom program that uh, uh, deletes all the keys from the Tetragon map. Okay, so Tetragon, the way they, they work like uh, commonly, like the same as uh, Tracy and Falco uh, and even Cubescape. So they have the map that holds a mapping between which processes are being monitored. Uh, and, and then in the, inside the eBPF, they have like a function that filters out the processes that uh, uh, like, like events from processes they are not monitoring. So if I empty those maps, uh, basically the tool is not doing anything. It's just installed there. So here I, I took uh, uh, a tool that uh, someone from a Valley Cyber company wrote, uh, which uh, emptied the maps of Falco and Tracy and basically disabled them that way. And I've added the support for uh, disabling Tetragon. So here I just deleted the maps of uh, Tetragon and uh, cat the Etsy shadow again, and we can see uh, no monitoring uh, on that. Cool. Again. Okay. 
Okay. So the next trick, really easy, but also in eBPF you need to know how to protect yourself from that. And it's just killing the agent, right? At the end of the day, it's just a process. If you're in the same PID name space and you have permissions, you can just kill that process. And uh, in eBPF, there are two ways uh, runtime detection tools can protect themselves. The first one being a BPF override return, which is a function that allows you to override the return address of the function you're hooking. And, but but the, the thing is, it applies only for uh, x86. You don't have it in ARM, for example. And it's not always enabled. So uh, here, like, the grep so you can see if it's enabled. And the second mechanism, which is more interesting, is uh, KRSI, which basically allows you to uh, play CBPF hooks over uh, LSM, uh, LSM uh, hooks. And this is interesting because uh, in, in, in difference from uh, TracePoint and KProbes, for example, uh, you can really modify the data and control the return code of, of those functions. And you can place them before system calls and after system calls. So uh, you have different functionality using this mechanism. Uh, so this is like a more reliable way to stop this uh, uh, sort of uh, tampering. And this is, can also uh, help you prevent from the tampering with the maps, for example. So what you can do, if we're going back for the previous trick, is placing those hooks, detect when someone is using the BPF system calls, for example, and is using it for communication with maps. And you can uh, check that it's not, for example, your process that is communicating with the map and uh, detect uh, the tampering that way. The next trick is event exhaustion. Uh, so as before, again, you can use uh, abuse the uh, eBPF maps because, uh, for example, the way, uh, let's say I want to monitor, um, I don't know, uh, processes in, in a system. So, or, or files, so let's go with files. So I wanna monitor files, I'm going to save uh, like the files I'm monitoring in the map. And the thing is that I, uh, like an attacker can just uh, create a lot of fake requests. Let's say I want to read Etsy Shadow, so I'll just generate uh, thousands of events reading, uh, I don't know, like a slash temp directory. The, the eBPF program is going to be filled with events and once it's filled with event, because it's asynchronically and it's not going to block the, the flow of the system call, uh, so nothing go is going to be saved into the queue or to the maps. And then there is this uh, thing called the event drop. So basically, uh, like after bombing the, the eBPF program with fake data, I can open the file that I want, and then uh, I get an undetected malicious activity that way. And I've put a link down here to the repo uh, so you can uh, mess with it yourself. The next trick, which is uh, common when copying buffering around, is time of check, time of use, right? So at the end of the day, eBPF uh, runs in uh, kernel context most of the time. So uh, when you copy the buffers from user mode uh, uh, to kernel, there is a different, uh, 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 like there is a problem between the time of you checking the data and the time of using the data. So uh, it's really easy to create this type of attack, right? So let's say, again, I want to read the sensitive file inside a, a, a container. So what I can do is write a program with two threads and a char buffer, which is the file that I want to read. And basically, uh, each, like one of the threads write the uh, sensitive file uh, path that I want, Etsy shadow, and the other thread writes uh, random string, for example. And they can run together. And of course, it's a race condition, right? Because uh, uh, you might check it exactly the, the time you place the, the sensitive string, but it can work. So let's see a demo of that as well. So again, I'm abusing Tetragon a lot today, but it also works on Falco and other tools. Uh, so here I create a symlink in the normal way. We can see it uh, monitors it, right? You can see the Cisco uh, in the above pane. It's a bit of small. And now I'm going to run the custom program with the two threads. We can see we read the, the TPASWD again, 
uh, but uh, no syscall was triggered in uh, Tetragon. So the next trick uh, is not really uh, too much related to eBPF, but it's more like a general trick for, uh, so it's good to know. So the way uh, file system in containers work is uh, usually union uh, uh, file systems. It's not like in regular uh, uh, Linuxes where you run uh, XT4, for example. And the way this file system work is having uh, layers because if you think about, let's say you download uh, two images into your machine, right? And both of them rely on Ubuntu as the base image. So there is no reason to hold two times the entire Ubuntu file system uh, on the node. So uh, the smart thing about uh, this type of file system is that uh, they divided into uh, three layers. And for example, if you take overlay FS, which is very common in containers. So we have the lower layer, which is the root FS, and always mounted as read-only. And then you have the upper layer, which is new files being created in the system. Or if you write to any of the uh, files in the lower layer, then a copy and write is being performed. And you basically copy the, uh, uh, or create the new file into the upper layer. And eventually what you, see, what you get is the merge layer, which is both the uh, lower layer and the upper layer together. And Runtime detection tools can really uh, rely on this file system uh, uh, structure and, detected, uh, and detect drifted binaries. Okay, so if you think about it, when you write your application as a developer, and then you built it, so you built your, the, the, the application into an image, everything that is going to run, or at least the entry point, if you uh, followed the right uh, uh, good practices, uh, is going to be inside that image, right? Like you're not going to download new binaries from third parties, so everything is going to be in the lower layer. And so new attackers, when coming to machines, uh, if they download tools from the outside, let's say I'm, I'm downloading an agent, I'm downloading uh, something, so it's going to be in the upper layer. And the runtime detection tools uh, can detect what's called drifted processes or drif drifted binaries, right? So they can detect when a process is being executed from the upper layer and not from the lower layer. And this is like very easy to detect and uh, an attacker can easily avoid that by just using uh, stuff that's in images, right? So you, you have, uh, for example, if you have curl or bash, okay? So you don't need to download kubectl in order to talk to the API server to extract information you can use the kernel that is on the machine. And that way, prevent the, the, that fingerprint. So, uh, and another mitigation is that if you as a developer or as a company want to detect your images and containers better, try to use uh, minimal images or distroless images, which basically uh, will force the attacker uh, to download tools from the outside. And then you can detect them that way. And here are some uh, simple, more cool tricks. Uh, so let's say you're attacking Kubernetes. And uh, in Kubernetes, it's very easy to detect when an attacker is talking to an API server, right? And so uh, you as an attacker, instead of downloading uh, kubectl and performing kubectl exec, and then basically what happens is that you talk to the API server. So if you're on the same node already, what you can do is to use NSenter Right? So NSenter basically allows you to enter the same namespace as the containers uh, uh, running in that node. Right? So a container is basically a process with different namespaces, C group, maybe SACOMP. So what you can do is use NSenter, and then you uh, save yourself the communication with the API server, and that way execute uh, and extract information from that container. Uh, the second point is init containers and ephemeral containers. And uh, so basically in Kubernetes, you have uh, different types of containers. You have regular containers and init containers and ephemeral containers. And an attacker, if you want to uh, deploy a container, let's say I want to deploy my uh, crypto miner in a Kubernetes environment. So uh, 
sometimes runtime detection tools and even Kubernetes itself had uh, two CVEs about uh, exactly that, that they forget to monitor uh, init containers and ephemeral containers and they are just monitoring uh, regular containers. So uh, this is, might be a good shot to try those containers. And the last point is uh, eBPF rootkits. So kernel modules uh, are very easy to detect and all of the runtime tools basically detect when you load the kernel module. And sometimes it's even impossible to load the kernel module. For example, if you, would, if you use uh, Docker as your runtime, uh, which is less common today in Kubernetes, but uh, Docker by default comes with a second profile that uh, prevents uh, uh, the system call of uh, init module for loading uh, kernel modules. So what you can do is basically abuse eBPF for rootkits as well. And there are a lot of examples for that. And eBPF today can, uh, like there are amazing examples in uh, GitHub open source that you can just download and play with, uh, whether it's uh, 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 stealing secrets or um, uh, even creating like a socket. So it's really cool. And Basically, that's it. If you have any questions. Yep. Okay, so we ask uh, how we can tell that if an eBPF program is being loaded uh, into the kernel. So basically, to load an eBPF program, you use the BPF system call. So uh, as a runtime detection tool, uh, you can just see if that system call is being executed, and then you can look on the arguments, see what exactly is being loaded, and that way uh, tell if an eBPF program uh, is being loaded. So uh, when you load the BPF program, you have a, a slash uh, C, CFS, uh, BPF usually. Uh, and then when eBPF program attaches, you can look there as well. Yeah. Yeah, so if I'll go back to it for the IO ring. So Basically, uh, IO Uring also relies on some system calls, right? Those three system calls. And so you can just detect those. But it's a bit harder to detect uh, IO Uring because, uh, uh, like, there is also legitimate use of IO Uring. Uh, so it's harder to detect that. You will need to hook other things uh, from those uh, system calls. Okay. So. So if you do, okay. So we ask if a uh, ROP. Yeah. So we ask if a uh, ROP can uh, help in avoiding uh, detection. So, like. If I think about it, you know, if you uh, perform a stack trace, uh, for example, from eBPF, in order to get the call stack of the, of the system call, and use ROP, so maybe like you can disrupt that, but uh, I don't have any other good answer for that now. Yeah. And what else? Okay, thank you.